This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Ghost Story by Mark Twain I took a large room, far up Broadway, in a huge old building whose upper stories had been wholly unoccupied for years until I came. The place had long been given up to dust and cobwebs, to solitude and silence. I seemed groping among the tombs and invading the privacy of the dead. That first night I climbed up to my quarters. For the first time in my life a superstitious dread came over me, and as I turned a dark angle of the stairway, and an invisible cobweb swung its lazy woof in my face and clung there, I shuddered as one who had encountered a phantom. I was glad enough when I reached my room and locked out the mould and darkness. A cheery fire was burning in the grate and I sat down before it with a comforting sense of relief. For two hours I sat there thinking of bygone times, recalling old scenes and summoning half-forgotten faces out of the mists of the past, listening, in fancy, to voices that long ago grew silent for all time, and to once familiar songs that nobody sings now. And as my reverie softened down to a sadder and sadder pathos, the shrieking of the winds outside softened to a wail, the angry beating of the rain against the panes diminished to a tranquil patter, and one by one the noises in the street subsided until the hurrying footsteps of the last belated straggler died away in the distance and left no sound behind. The fire had burned low. A sense of loneliness crept over me. I arose and undressed, moving on tiptoe about the room, doing stealthily what I had to do, as if I were environed by sleeping enemies whose slumbers it would be fatal to break. I covered up in bed and lay listening to the rain and wind and the faint creak of distant shutters till they lulled me to sleep. I slept profoundly, but how long I do not know. All at once I found myself awake, and filled with a shuddering expectancy. All was still. All but my own heart. I could hear it beat. Presently the bedclothes began to slip away slowly towards the foot of the bed, as if someone were pulling them. I could not stir, I could not speak. Still, the blanket slipped deliberately away till my breast was uncovered. Then, with great effort, I seized them and drew them over my head. I waited, listened, waited. Once more that steady pull began, and once more I lay torbid a century of dragging seconds till my breast was naked again. At last I roused my energies and snatched the covers back to their place and held them with a strong grip. I waited. By and by I felt a faint tug and took a fresh grip. The tug strengthened to a steady strain. It grew stronger and stronger. My hold parted, and for the third time the blanket slid away. I groaned. An answering groan came from the foot of the bed. Beaded drops of sweat stood upon my forehead. I was more dead than alive. Presently I heard a heavy footstep in my room. The step of an elephant, it seemed to me. It was not like anything human. But it was moving from me. There was relief in that. I heard it approach the door, pass out without moving bolt or lock, and wander away among the dismal corridors, straining the floors and joists till they creaked again as it passed. And then silence reigned once more. When my excitement had calmed, I said to myself, This is a dream, simply a hideous dream. And so I lay thinking it over until I convinced myself that it was a dream. And then a comforting laugh relaxed my lips, and I was happy again. I got up and struck a light. When I found the locks and bolts were just as I had left them, another soothing laugh welled in my heart and rippled from my lips. I took my pipe and lit it, and was just sitting down before the fire when, down went the pipe, out of my nerveless fingers, the blood forsook my cheeks, and my placid breathing was cut short with a gasp. In the ashes on the hearth, side by side, with my own bare footprint, was another so vast that in comparison mine was but an infant's. That I had had a visitor. The elephant tread was explained. I put out the light and returned to bed, palsied with fear. I lay a long time, peering into the darkness and listening. Then I heard a grating noise overhead, like the dragging of a heavy body across the floor. Then the throwing down of the body, and the shaking of my windows in response to the concussion. In distant parts of the building I heard the muffled slamming of doors. 
I heard at intervals stealthy footsteps creeping in and out among the corridors and up and down the stairs. Sometimes these noises approached my door, hesitated, and went away again. I heard the clanking of chains faintly in remote passages, and listened while the clanking grew near, while it wearily climbed the stairways, marking each move by the loose surplus of chain that fell with an accented rattle upon each succeeding step as the goblin that bore it advanced. I heard muttered sentences, half-uttered screams that seemed smothered violently, and the swish of invisible garments and the rush of invisible wings. Then I became conscious that my chamber was invaded, that I was not alone. I heard sighs and breathing about my bed, and mysterious whisperings. Three little spheres of phosphorescent light appeared on the ceiling directly over my head, clung and glowed there for a moment, and then dropped. Two of them upon my face and one upon the pillow. They spattered liquidly and felt warm. Intuition told me that they had turned to gouts of blood as they fell. I needed no light to satisfy myself of that. Then I saw pallid faces, dimly luminous, and white uplifted hands floating bodiless in the air, floating a moment and then disappearing. The whispering ceased and the voices and the sounds, and a solemn stillness followed. I waited and listened. I felt that I must have light or die. I was weak with fear. I slowly raised myself toward a sitting posture, and my face came in contact with a clammy hand. All strength went from me, apparently, and I fell back like a stricken invalid. Then I heard the rustle of a garment. It seemed to pass to the door and go out. When everything was still once more, I crept out of bed, sick and feeble, and lit the gas with a hand that trembled as if it were aged with a hundred years. The light brought out some little cheer to my spirits. I sat down and fell into a dreamy contemplation of that great footprint in the ashes. By and by its outlines began to waver and grow dim. I glanced up, and the broad gas flame was slowly wilting away. In the same moment I heard that elephantine tread again. I noted its approach nearer and nearer, along the musty halls, and dimmer and dimmer the light waned. The tread reached my very door and paused. The light had dwindled to a sickly blue, and all things about me were in a spectral twilight. The door did not open, and yet I felt a faint gust of air fan my cheek, and presently was conscious of a huge cloudy presence before me. I watched it with fascinated eyes. A pale glow stole over the thing. Gradually its cloudy folds took shape. An arm appeared, then legs, then a body, and at last a great sad face looked out of the vapour. Stripped of its filmy housings, naked, muscular, and comely, the majestic Cardiff giant loomed above me. Oh, my misery vanished, for a child might know that no harm could come with that benignant countenance. My cheerful spirits returned at once, and in sympathy with them the gas turned up brightly again. Never a lone outcast was so glad to welcome company as I was to greet the friendly giant. I said, Why, is it nobody but you? Do you know I have been scared to death for the last two or three hours? I am most honestly glad to see you. I wish I had a chair. Here, here, don't try to sit down in that thing. But it was too late. He was in before I could stop him, and down he went. I never saw a chair slivered so in my life. Stop, stop, you'll ruin it. Too late. There was another crash, and another chair was resolved into its original elements. Confound it! Haven't you any judgment at all? Do you want to ruin all the furniture on the place? Here, here, you petrified fool. But it was no use. Before I could arrest him, he sat down on the bed, and it was a melancholy ruin. Now what sort of way is that to do? First you come lumbering about the place, bringing a legion of vagabond goblins along with you to worry me to death. And then, when I overlook an indelicacy of costume, which would not be tolerated anywhere by cultivated people except in a respectable theatre, and not even there, if the nudity were of your sex. You repay me by wrecking all the furniture you can find to sit down on. And why will you? You damage yourself as much as you do me. You have broken off the end of your spinal column, and littered up the floor with the chips of your hands till the place looks like a marble yard. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You are big enough to know better. Well, I I, I will not break any more furniture, but what am I to do? I had not a chance to sit down for a century. And the tears came into his eyes. Poor devil, I said. I should not have been so harsh with you. And you are an orphan, too, no doubt. 
"'But sit down on the floor here. "'Nothing else can stand your weight, and, besides, "'we cannot be sociable with you, away up there above me. "'I want you down where I can perch on this high counting-house stool "'and gossip with you face to face.' "'So he sat down on the floor and lit a pipe which I gave him, "'threw one of my red blankets over his shoulders, "'inverted my sitz-bath on his head, helmet fashion, "'and made himself picturesque and comfortable. "'Then he crossed his ankles while I renewed the fire.' and exposed the flat honeycomb bottoms of his prodigious feet to the grateful warmth. "'What is the matter with the bottom of your feet and the back of your legs, that they are gouged up so?' "'Infernal chilblains! I caught them clear up to the back of my head, roosting out there under the Newell's farm. But I love this place, I love it as one loves his old home. There is no peace for me like the peace I feel when I am there.' We talked along for an hour, and then I noticed that he looked tired, and I spoke of it. "'Tired?' he said. "'Well, I should think so. "'And now I will tell you all about it, "'since you have treated me so well. "'I am the spirit of the petrified man "'that lies across the street, there, in the museum. "'I am the ghost of the Cardiff giant. "'I can have no rest, no peace, "'till they have given that poor body burial again. "'Now, what was the most natural thing for me to do? "'To make men satisfy this wish? "'Terrify them into it, haunt the place where the body lay.' So I haunted the museum night after night. I got the other spirits to help me, but it did no good, for nobody ever came to the museum at midnight. Then it occurred to me to come over the way and haunt this place a little. I felt that if I ever got a hearing, I must succeed, for I had the most efficient company that tradition could furnish. Night after night we have shivered around through these mildewed halls, dragging chains, groaning, whispering, tramping up and down stairs, till, to tell you the truth, I am almost worn out. "'But when I saw a little light in your room to-night, "'I roused my energies again, "'and went at it with a deal of the old freshness. "'But I am tired out, entirely fagged out. "'Give me, I beseech you, give me some hope.' "'I lit off my perch in a burst of excitement and exclaimed, "'This transcends everything, everything that ever did occur. "'Why, you poor blundering old fossil, "'you have had all your trouble for nothing. "'You have been haunting a plaster cast of yourself. "'The real Cardiff giant is not Albany.' "'Confound it! Don't you know your own remains?' I never saw such an eloquent look of shame, of pitiable humiliation, overspread a countenance before. The petrified man rose slowly to his feet and said, uh -huh, "'Honestly, is that true?' "'As true as I am sitting here.' He took the pipe from his mouth and laid it on the mantel, then stood irresolute a moment, unconsciously from old habit, thrusting his hands where his pantaloon pocket should have been, and meditatively dropping his chin on his breast, and finally said, "'Well, I never felt so absurd before. The petrified man has sold everything else, and now the mean fraud has ended by selling his own ghost. My son, if there was any charity left in your heart for a poor, friendless phantom like me, don't let this get out. Think how you would feel, if you had made such an ass of yourself.' I heard his stately tramp die away, step by step, down the stairs, and out into the deserted street, and felt sorry that he had gone, poor fellow, and sorrier still that he had carried off my red blanket and my bathtub. End of A Ghost Story by Mark Twain